Welcome to lecture 18. 18, we're going to work Pogol activity 9A, which is page 94 in your Pogol book. And um, I will let you go ahead and answer the questions on this page as I bring model one. Uh, model one is nucleophilic substitution reactions. We have a nucleophile and we have an electrophile. This is equation one. Now the first one you have an R group and the R is just a generic carbon. It can be any carbon. And in equation two, the R group is actually a CH3. And so this equation two is more specific with an example. I would get something like equation two in your reaction sheets. And equation three just shows you another example. All right, so for question one. For the general substitution equation, model one, what bond is formed in the reaction? Okay, so what bond is being formed? Bonds formed will always be on the product side, okay? So the bond formed is your nucleophile TR. What bond is broken in the reaction? Bonds broken will be on the reactant side. So these will be bonds broken. And so here is our bond broke, right? So Rx. Circle the leaving group or the atom that leaves from the reactant. So the X minus here is your leaving group. Okay, so there's your leaving group. And 1D, provide an explanation for why this reaction is called a substitution reaction. Did you write the X is substituted or you could say exchanged for the nucleophile? All right, so what about 2A? Okay, now we're on question 2A. A nucleophile is nucleus loving, is attracted to an atom with a positive charge. A nucleophile will donate It's electrons. Based on this answer, would a nucleophile be considered a Lewis acid or a Lewis base? And Lewis acid, uh, Lewis base. So nucleophiles um, kind of act like bases sometimes with those lone pairs. Okay, to C. Consider the CX bond. In, in model one of the reagents, where X is a halogen, at a delta positive for 
and a delta negative to the bonds to indicate the direction of the CX is polarized. So here you have this is your negative and this is your delta positive. What part of the CX bond will the nucleophile be attracted to? The nucleophile will be attracted to the delta positive because the nucleophile um, loves a positive. So 2E, an electrophile, electrophile is electron loving. It will be attracted to an atom with a negative charge. An electrophile has electrons to accept. So it has, it will accept electrons. Would an electrophile be considered a Lewis acid? Okay. Um, when you get to organic two, you'll learn aluminum trichloride is one of your strongest Lewis acids. Okay. And if you drew out aluminum trichloride, you would see that aluminum is sp3 i mean sp2 here sp2 and it has this unhybridized p orbital so it's flat with the every one of these chlorines are about 120 degrees um, in a flat planar um, geometric shape and then you have this unhybridized p orbital and this is one of your best lewis acids so that's an example and so nucleophiles can donate their electrons into that unhybridized p orbital. So an electrophile would be considered a Lewis acid. Label the nucleophile and electrophile in equation two and three. This is important folks. You're going to have to be able to do this for all your quizzes and exams. So you want to find a nucleophile and you all can just write like I do my electric nucleophile and this would be your electrophile because this would be delta minus and this is a delta positive, so it's that carbon that's your electrophile. In equation three, your nucleophile is always where you have either a negative charge or a lone pair, and you'll see later too a double bond. And then this is your, you always want to show your polarity with these partial positives, and this will be your electrophile. And I also want you to label your leaving group when I ask you to do it. So. All right, three, use curved arrows above to illustrate the mechanism that will accomplish the substitution reaction in model one. Remember the curved arrows show electron movement. All right, so your curved arrows, you're gonna have to be able to do this. It's always the nucleophile lone pairs going towards that positive carbon. And then those electrons get pushed off onto your leaving group. So you have two electron flow arrows here in the nitrile and it does backside attack, okay? It's gonna go behind the iodide and then those electrons go there. And so you'll need to be able to label nucleophile, electrophile, leaving group, and draw your products on the, we will work on drawing those products, and your electron flow arrows for this mechanism. Okay, so now we're on model two. And this is a one step nucleophilic substitution, SN2. So the mechanism for the SN2 reaction is shown below. So go ahead and start answering those questions while I draw out your model. Okay, in this transition state. All right, so let's do 4A. 
how many reactants are involved in the reaction? Okay, so this is your reactant side. Did you write two? Label the nucleophile and electrophile and circle the leaving group. So you want to be able to do this. This is your nucleophile. It's going to be the negative charge and the lone pairs. Um, you'll want to circle this. This is your leaving group. It's always going to be your halogen. So your leaving groups are going to be either bromine, iodide, or chlorine. You also have other leaving groups, but this is the alkyl halides. There's your delta positive, so this is your electrophile this molecule is, and that's your leaving group. Um, okay, for C, what bond is formed in the reaction? So let's look at our products here. These are always bonds formed, and you see that you have the iodomethane, so CH3 iodide is your new bond. What bond is broken? What bond is broken? CH3Br. Okay, draw curved arrows to show electron movement. And you need to be able to do this. You always draw from the lone pair, backside attack, and then those electrons go with bromine. And so there's your two electron flow arrows. Okay, 5A. How many reactants are present in the transition state? So now we're talking about the transition state. Um, how many reactants? Both, right? So two of them. Because you have your iodide here. You see that there. And then you have your leaving group here. So they're there. Okay. Um, based on your answer for 5A, Explain why an SN2 is bimolecular. Bimolecular means two. And two of the reagents, the reactants, are um, required for the reaction to happen. To happen in the transition state. And I'm just going to write TS with the double arrow. Okay, it's proportional. So your reaction rate, this is really what you want to say. Your rate equals K times um, iodide nucleophile times your electrophile. Okay, so this is your reaction rate. The rate is proportional to both nucleophile and electrophile. The dotted line in the transition state represents a partial bond. This suggests that the bonds are being formed and broken, stepwise or simultaneously. Okay, one of the words you want for this reaction is concerted. Now, when you go to a concert, think of an orchestra. You got maybe trumpets playing and flutes playing. They're all doing it at the same time, okay? So that's simultaneously. And that's why it's concerted. That's a concert. And so these bonds are being made and broken at the same time. That's requirement if you're going to have a stereospecific reaction. You always see the stereospecific reactions are always simultaneously. Bonds are being made and broken at the same time. In the transition state, the incoming nucleophile is on the, and stereospecific means it comes in opposite side. Okay, it will come in from a specific side and always give you um, a specific Stereo, see stereo um, isomer. And that's because it has backside attack. All right, turning the page, I'm on 5G. Essen, determine why the transition state shown in model 2 would be more favorable than a transition state where the incoming group and the leaving group are on the same side. Um, the reason why is because this is an an sp3 bond here. Okay, so there's your hybridized bond. And this back side here, this is your anti-bonding bonding orbital. Okay, if you put these electrons into this orbital, then it will break it will break the um, current bond. All right, so this is what I wrote, and I want you to get this in your notes for this reaction. 
um, SN2 is inversion of stereochemistry. Okay, in order to get inversion of stereochemistry, the nucleophile must attack the carbon opposite of the leaving group. And I'm going to be looking for that in your electron flow arrows. Okay, number six. Okay, number six, question six is a reaction energy diagram. And I need you to draw this reaction energy diagram. Label the reactants, transition states, and the products. So we have energy on the Y. We have reaction progress on the X. Okay, so here we have just that. You have one hump. This is a transition state. And this one would be iodide coming in, carbon, bromine leaving, All right, so there's your transition state, the very peak. And your products then would be and that's why I'm showing you these dashes and wedges to show stereo specificity. Okay, so there's your products. Your reactants. All right, so the ones reactions, transition state. All right, and then while we're here, I'm just going to go ahead and show you that this is your activation energy, okay? A to the E. And that is the energy required, the rate determining step for these two um, nucleophile and electrophile to come together. And then the energy difference between these two is your delta H, and this would be an exothermic reaction because your product energy is lower than your starting energy. You will need to be able to label an energy diagram for this reaction and draw the reaction mechanism. Okay, so now we're going to focus on stereochemistry, and that's what question number seven is talking about. Okay, so we're going to learn about this stereochemistry. So you have iodide as your nucleophile, and now we have a real stereo center here. Okay, because this is a real stereogenic carbon. It's a carbon connected to four different things, right? Okay, so you need to determine whether this is R and S. So let's set our priorities. Bromine would be one. Hydrogen would be four. Okay, we got a carbon and a carbon, and this one then goes another carbon, so there's two, and this is three, and then we connect the one, two, three. And that is turning the steering wheel to the right or going clockwise. And then hydrogen and back. So R stays R. Okay, and then it shows here that after the reaction takes place, an iodide comes in the back. And bromine has left. Then we have the CH3, it's still on the wedge here. This hydrogen's still in the back here. And then this is CH2, CH3. You see how that's drawn? You might have to do that sometimes, okay? So you keep whatever is on the dashes and the wedges, on the dashes and wedges, but it's just kind of like an umbrella turned inside out. And um, another thing about that is that's where I tell you to keep your dashes and wedges on the same side. Um, all right, and let's label those again. Um, now we have iodide is number one, hydrogen is number four, this carbon is number two, and this carbon is number three. We're going to connect the one, two, three. Now this is turning to the left clockwise, S, and hydrogen is in the back, so S stays S. Okay, so do we see that we have inversion of stereochemistry? 9 out of 10, maybe 9.5 out of 10, you're going to get an R becomes an S or an S becomes an R. Every once in a while you can have inversion of stereochemistry and 
it doesn't actually give you a different R and S, so that's not necessary. Um, so we just did the absolute configuration, so we did 7A. Explain how stereochemistry provides which side the nucleophile approaches the reactant with reference to the leaving group. Um, the stereochemistry is determined experimentally. You get 100% inversion. That's what I would write, 100% inversion. So most of the time, R goes to S and S goes to R. We are now on model three. Looks like we have two more models for this Pogel activity. Uh, model three talks about the nucleophile, and model four, we'll talk about the electrophile. So let's look at model three, and we're going to rank these nucleophiles and study them. Recall that a nucleophile is a Lewis base, so it's going to donate electrons, which donates electrons. And you also have some charts in your book that you want to look at. Um, sometimes you might even want to make some index cards for positive. All right, so 8A. Circle the compounds that could act as nucleophiles. Cross out the ones that would not. So normally I'd have you all go to the board. The first one, do we circle it or do we cross it out? Did you circle it because it has a negative charge and lone pairs? Second one, this is why you want to draw in your lone pairs, folks. There you go, nucleophile. What about hydrogen? Lewis structure. Nope. What about a carbocation? Nope. Those act as electrophiles, don't they? And what about nitrogen? This is Mr. Clean. This is ammonia. Lone pair. Correct. So you have to have, explain why compounds circled act as nucleophiles. So as you write a nucleophile must have a lone pair. Charges for a nucleophile make a stronger nucleophile. So which one's stronger? Oh, uh, water or OH minus? OH minus, stronger. All right, what features must all nucleophiles have? We said it needs to have a lone pair. Um, once your group reaches consensus, come up with an explanation of why you crossed out the compounds. Hydrogen, CH3+, plus, they have no lone pair. Okay, so it cannot be a nucleophile. Let's go to question number nine. So we have to decide which compounds are better nucleophiles. And you need to think of charge, electronegativity, size, basicity, and polarizability. So it's how well can it hold its electrons when it, um, and it's all about its electrons. Okay, so when you're comparing CH3OH, which is methanol, versus CH3O minus, that's methoxide, so I'll write this down for you all to learn your language. And this is methanol. All right. Which one's going to be stronger? The methoxide because of the negative charge. Okay. The next one. We have hydroxyl. So hydroxide versus F minus. Um, this is a horrible nucleophile. I'm going to tell you why. Um, fluoride really has such a strong electronegativity that it pulls those, it's, it's called a hard, that would be a hard anion, okay? It really pulls that electron tight, and it's really small, okay? And it just, it's just, it's really hard to get it to act as a nucleophile. The OH um, is a better nucleophile.
All right, iodide versus chlorine. Okay, so I said fluorine was horrible. Iodide is great. So they're all in the same group. Okay, and iodide is just large. They call this the Buick. The big Buick of, um, of cars. It's, it has such a big shell when you put an electron there. It's just it's like the Goodyear blimp. All right, and then we have... Um, we have an ethoxide versus a terbutoxide. Okay, so this is tert-butoxide. And definitely the ethoxide because it's less sterically hindered. All right, so now we have model four. Model four is going to talk about electrophiles. An electrophile is a Lewis acid. So it will accept electrons. And so we have these here. Okay, for question 10A, circle the compounds that would act as electrophiles. Um, some of these you might actually want to draw out the Lewis structure. I've said before, if you draw out the Lewis structure, it will help you solve problems. Okay, so here we have CH3, CH3, you can easily see this is your carbocation. Here, when you draw this out, it helps you to see that nitrogen has a lone pair. And if you draw the hydroxide out, you would put your lone pairs in there. And so you could easily see that an electrophile would be this carbocation and then this slightly positive carbon would be also an electrophile. And it's cross out the ones that would not be. So that would not be and that would not be because these have lone pairs. Okay, so lone pairs, you know these are going to be nucleophile. Uh, why did you circle these compounds? These tend to be electron deficient. Okay, they're either a full positive charge or a delta positive charge because of the polarity. And that's the feature that an electrophile must have, a full positive, um, or it can have an empty p orbital. Okay, and that's like aluminum trichloride. Even though it doesn't have a charge, it has this unhybridized p orbital. Um, that's the way carbocations are. So carbocations, they're sp2, like this, and then they have this unhybridized p orbital that electrons can go into. So you use electrons can go right in there. And you form a new bond. Okay, once your group has reached consensus, come up with an explanation of why you crossed out the compounds that would not act as electrophiles. So these ones here that would not act as electrophiles, they have lone pairs and therefore they're electron rich. Okay, so, all right, what about 11? Okay, consider the following reaction. Remember, R can be any carbon. Okay, label the Rx bond with delta positive and delta negative. And show the dipole moment, the bond polarity. Why would Rx be considered an electrophile? I put R group would be electron deficient. I think number 12 is confusing, okay, so uh, because it makes you think backwards and forwards. I would just cross all that out, okay, just don't even look at 12. Sometimes we get, um, yeah, so don't even do 12, A, B, C, or D. Let's just go straight to 13. 
Okay, so number 13. Uh, circle the better leaving group for each of the following pairs. Explain your answer using terms such as charge, electronegativity, size, basicity, and polarizability. Oh, say so this is leaving group. Your best leaving group are the ones that are going to stabilize that negative charge. And I want you to give Y. Okay, so your better one between iodide and chloride is iodide because it's larger. Okay, so it's more polarizable. So it's going to be better. Okay, uh, you're comparing bromide versus fluoride. I told you fluoride is a horrible leaving group. Horrible, not a leaving group. Okay, and so once again, it's the size. This is larger, more polarizable. When you get going down a group, it gets really big. All right, hydroxide versus chloride. All right, this is kind of an interesting one here. Um, this is actually a bad leaving group. Bad leaving group, horrible. Okay, it's a great nucleophile. Horrible, horrible, horrible leaving group. Okay, this is a good leaving group. Um, and then, so if you have hydroxide versus water water is very neutral it's you know it's the world solvent right here is that pretty uh pretty stable yes this is one of the world's best leaving group best leaving group and we already said this is a horrible leaving group okay it's just so reactive okay it's just not going to leave all right you have additional problems 17 um, 17, the questions are good. Um, let's see, 17 A, B, and C. You have 17, there's two 17s, folks, so you can do 17 1, 17 2. It's a misprint. Uh, you need to show your stereochemistry where you have it. And 18 um, is pretty good. Um, the reagent I put on here is, yeah, so hopefully you'll see that. I'll just go ahead, sodium cyanide. All right, um, on to 9B, good job.